I, it's a shame, really. Uh, just personally, because I enjoy playing with him very much. Um, in another way, it's great because you now we can look forward to playing with somebody else. You know, we find somebody nice, a good guitar player we can sing to, so that we can do some more things. Maybe, you know, preferably somebody that can. He's a good guitar player that can maybe play something else as well, you know. As Mick Taylor was getting into bass and piano and even drums, it would be nice to get somebody that can at least do something on another instrument you know, mm -hmm. so that it's not confined just to the guitar. Memphis to Dallas. Keith opens with this story in his autobiography, Life. The Stones experienced a real scary plane trip from D.C. to Memphis on July 3rd, 1975. Everyone from the tour on that plane either prayed and or cried in some way. The plane had gone through some horrific thunderstorms. Columnist and tour writer Lisa Robinson, when arrived, kissed the tarmac after getting off the plane. Keith and Ronnie said, screw that. Let's drive down to our next gig in Dallas after we do this Memphis show. So they were joined by the not so popular friend of Keith, Freddie Sessler. Let's just say Freddie has had his most prime pharmaceutical drug connections and he shared them with Keith. They were also joined by a Stone security guard named Jim Callahan. Stone's lawyer, Bill Carter, who was from Arkansas, he told them not to drive through Arkansas at all and to certainly don't stray off the interstate. He mentioned also Arkansas, they wanted to create a legislation to outlaw rock and roll. This is 1975. So they rented a yellow Chevy and Impala. Keith, he drove leisurely, not the typical Keith in the roads of England. However, having a grand old time with the folks, smoking, taking drugs, and doing what they do. And they'll stop in little small towns, picking up and collecting small miniature bottles of homemade and handwritten labels of bourbon. So Keith, now driving in Arkansas and driving real slow, slow enough that the Arkansas drivers informed the police. They stopped in a hick town called Fordyce, population about 5,200. They stopped in a random restaurant, and as they were sitting and waiting for food, things were moving real slow. The patrons noticed the Keith and Ronnie decided to go to the bathroom together. As they're walking, they're laughing and joking and giggling. They were in there for about 40 minutes. And again, the patrons took notice of this, especially the staff. So now calls are being made to the police. So after they did what they did and ate, they left the restaurant. As soon as they got in the car and they pulled out of the restaurant lot, the police jumped on them and pulled them over. Two officers were in front of the car with a pistol and a shotgun drawn at them. As they walk up to the car, they saw Keith's knife right next to him. They were arresting for carrying a concealed weapon, but it was not concealed. It was just in plain sight. So Keith, he didn't argue and he complied. He knew he had to do this. Why? Well, because he knew the door panels were filled with grass and coke. Backups arrived, more police and more guns. They had Keith drive to the station while following him, and as they were driving, they're dumping their goods outside the window. They parked in City Hall, and the police searched what they could and took the car, and some of the police had no idea who they were arresting, but some did, and they still wanted autographs. So now word was spreading about this to the public in the town. They were not handcuffed nor put in a cell. Now, outside, people started showing up with their Stones album, and they had cameras. They wanted to take pictures. Now, also, the news media arrives. 
But everyone was nice except the arresting officer. Eventually, they got a hold of good old Bill Carter again, the lawyer. He was actually from Little Rock, Arkansas. He said, hold on, boys. I'm flying down right now as soon as possible today. Told him not to say a word or do anything. As they waited, they were bored. Keith realized he's wearing a jeans hat. Takes the jeans hat off, looks at the little pockets on the hat around the side. And guess what's in those pockets? What were they filled with? So each of them, one by one, goes into the bathroom and gets their hit. Ronnie had to really go to the stall. And in a short time, Freddie walks in. And right in front of the stall, he drops his pills, his downers, his two and alls. They're scattered all, all over the floor, right in front of Ronnie's stall. Freddie peeked under the door and said, Ronnie... Can you please, please let me use the stall? I got to flush these down. Ronnie said, no way, man. So Freddie ate the pills. The judge and police chief were arguing on the situation, what to do. They realized how this scene can turn into a bad press for the town. And within the young fans that are gathered outside could cause some chaos. As time went on with the judge and chief, they kept on drinking their bourbon and eventually getting pretty ripped. Next thing, Keith and Ronnie notice this, and they start taking the liberty of walking around the station. Police were still getting autographs. Keith and Ronnie asked to see the courtroom. So they were hanging in the courtroom. All of a sudden, the doors fly open, and people started rushing in, looking for the autographs and finding Keith and Ronnie. They made friends with the locals. The judge's wife even made them sandwiches. It was becoming a real long day. Bill Carter did make it, and it was late in the evening. Now, calls were starting coming into the police station from all over the world to get the scoop. The police now allowed the four of them to go one by one to the Impala and get their belongings. As each of them went, they would each throw out their stashes and hidings while they had the chance. Freddie took his briefcase. When they asked him to open it, he said he didn't have the key. So a cop sawed it open. Inside, two Sessler vials of pure coke. The cop asked what was in the vials, and Freddie said, tooth powder. They busted Freddie for one jar. They also found stashes behind the back seat. Now, with Bill Carter there, they argued. It was a rental car, and it would be a hard proof to say that the drugs were theirs. A long process, and then it ended when they issued Keith with reckless driving. They took his knife as a souvenir, but never charged him. Keith paid his $162 fine, and they said it was due to him leaving that parking lot. The car squealed and kicked up gravel. Keith would say, 20 yards of reckless driving. While this was happening, the chaos outside was shouting, free Keith. So they agreed to go back to the courtroom, invite some media, and did a little press conference. Freddie, well, they paid his $5,000 bond for the coke, and the charges were not valid due to was not a legal search. They left in a private plane. A day in the life as a stone. Now, the owner of the Fordyce Diner, well, he was still in Memphis, 200 miles away. He missed all of this. He had driven there to see the Stones perform the night before. Uh, when we were stopped for speeding <clears throat> in Arkansas, Keith and I and a security man and a friend, the judge of that particular area in Arkansas, he went completely spare on the phone. We found he had um, a little stash of whiskey down his sock and he was gradually getting more and more soused till he got onto the... Uh, the press all over the world. We were saying, yes, we got Rolling Stone on drugs, Charles, you know, the Paris Chronicle and the New Zealand Times. Yeah. He was loving it, you know. Eventually had to be carried out by his brother. He was the only one who could remove him. Stuck right in my brain. You're just a memory. I believe. That used to be You're just a memory Of a love That used to mean so much to me
Welcome to Flipside CT YouTube video channel. You're here to watch my Rolling Stones Black and Blue Deep Album Insight. My channel's dedicated to getting the public exposed to the music that I enjoy. You will find I have several types of videos on my channel, documentaries, and what we call vinyl finds or buys. These are records I buy and give an insight about them, including record shows and stores I visit throughout the U.S. I need to mention a disclaimer. There is absolutely no profit or monetary funds that I receive for this. This is all done out of passion. It's also a do-it-yourself project. No professional equipment is used to record with. It's all about the content I put together here. Hopefully you'll disregard any mispronunciations or delivery. I'm 100% content and proud of what I created for you. So as they say, sit back, put the headphones on, and enjoy this multi-part show. If you ask a casual Rolling Stones fan, just a casual one, what they think of the album Black and Blue, some typical replies would be, it's okay, I don't listen to it much, I don't really care for it, it's one of the worst Stones albums there is, probably the most chaotic Stones album. Man, they surely miss Mick Taylor. It's a downhill slide starting from here. These are real interesting comments for the great rock and roll band. The Stones surely flipped a few pages past their post-Golden Era, and they started to blend in and be part of the world around them and adapt to musical styles that they're not common or safe with. It was music happening at the time. It was funk, reggae. Rather than that old rock and roll in your face, the Stones took on the flavors of today. There's some disco discussions also. Now, disco was built on the drum beat called Four on the Floor. That means one bass drum to every beat, 4-4. Four, four. I didn't hear it much in here. Some examples of what some critics would say. A few songs here try to sound like Brown Sugar and Tumbling Dice, and those few are not even their best ones. Stones, they got some problems. Keith seems to run out of melodic ideas totally, all together. Like their majority of their post-exile repertoire, these new songs are based on loose riffs rather than tight song structures. This music lacks energy. The Rolling Stone magazine, April 76, said, We had to wait two years for this? What a lack of enthusiasm. The heat's off because it's over. They really don't matter anymore or stand for anything. The first meaningless Stones album, and thank God. Now, we saw Goat's Head and its only rock and roll album start to emphasize the Stones trying their twist of non-rock and roll styles. There was a lean towards black musical styles, as mentioned funk, smooth R&B, and reggae. They were exploring. Some bands stick with the same formula over and over and over again. But like great artists, there are periods of exploration. Now this came about in the studio and from touring with supporting musicians. Step in, Billy Preston. His historic resume started at age 12 with an appearance in the film St. Louis Blues. That was with Nat King Cole, Pearl Bailey, and Eartha Kitt. He played organ for Little Richard. From there, he met the Beatles very early on in Europe and became friends with them. He played with Sam Cooke and became the organist in the house band for the TV show called Shindig. I played with the Stones on an uh, American TV show, Shindig. It was produced by Jack Good, yay. And um, they came and they, they were doing a show with Howlin' Wolf. And what that year was that? That was about 65 or 66. So now, 10 years on, what's changed about their music, first of all? Anything? Not anything. <laughs> <laughs> Not a thing has changed, really. He toured with Ray Charles, worked on the Beatles album, Let It Be. And he played at the final performance on the rooftop. Billy contributed to the Stones albums and tours from 71 to 76. 
due to the declining health of Nicky Hopkins. Billy's first appearance is on Sticky Fingers. Can't You Hear Me Knocking and I Got the Blues. And one song on Exile, Shine a Light. It was Mick that brought in Billy for a gospel feel, for overdubs. You can hear Billy's influence all over Goat's Head with his influential clavinet and wah-wah pedal. Listen to 100 Years Ago in Heartbreaker. It's giving a newly found funkiness sound, one you'd never heard before. His influence. In its only rock and roll, Billy shares a dose of an Ain't Too Proud to Beg, the one song that bridges its only rock and roll to black and blue, his fingerprint file. It was funky. It could fit on his album also. It is out there. It's unique, creative, and it's out of the safe zone for the Stones. And it's out of the box brilliant. Billy was given a free reign to open door, to elevate the Stones, to get them to another level of sound, the one that was popular today. Jumping ahead, Billy decided to part from the Stones after 76 due to his reportedly unhappiness with the lack of the credit given to him for one of the black and blue tracks, Melody, along with some other contractual concerns. More on that later. It was Billy that jammed with Mick in March of 77 during the famous Toronto El Macambo show while waiting for Keith. Billy and Mick came up with the song Miss You, the 4-4 beat. He did work later on Saint of Me from Bridges to Babylon and Mick's solo album Wandering Spirit. During live shows, Mick would goof on Billy and give Billy's hotel room number and tell all the young boys to drop by and visit him. Tease him a lot about his wigs, which he didn't like. He took it really good humor, but he, he didn't like it, so I had to like restrain myself. I had a lot of jokes when I introduced him about his wigs. Because he had so many different ones. And course- Billy did jam with the New Barbarians. Hopefully you know who they are, Ronnie's band, with Keith to promote his solo album work. Billy did play in L.A. in 1979 during an encore with them. Now it's very important to start off with Billy on this Black and Blue album review because he is a main ingredient. Some think too much, the purists, because they expected a pure rock and roll album. October 16th, and 18th, 1974, the Stones release its only rock and roll album. Now, while living in Geneva, Switzerland, Keith invited the four other Stones to join him for a Stones meeting and discuss the next year's plans. This was October 25th to the 28th, 1974. Mick, Charlie, Mick Taylor, Bill Wyman. The plan... They talked about doing some studio sessions in December, coming up for a new album, a May release, tour in June for a year, U.S., South America, Canada, work on a live album, October to November of 75, start in Australia, Asia, Africa tour, part two, maybe make a movie in December, start another album, then part three. Europe and Russia tour, then end in June of 76. These were the plans, the proposal. This is what was put out on the table for all of them. Well, Mick Taylor apparently came in with some heavy, heavy issues. And I'm not sure what was said, but he was angry and he left after a day. Mick Jagger said that Taylor was so depressed and so frustrated. They all felt it. Personal problems and was bored. On November 14th, Mick and Bianca, they attend a New York City party at the Hippopotamus Club in honor of the Sgt. Pepper's play. Lennon and Ronnie Spector were there also. On December 4th, after an Eric Clapton show, Film producer, manager of Cream and Bee Gees, Robert Stigwood, was hosting a party in his country home in Berkshire. Ronnie Wood was there and happened to be sitting between Mick Taylor, 
and Mick Jagger. Mick Taylor leans over to Mick Jagger and says, I'm leaving the group. Ronnie laughs, but Taylor says, I am serious. Taylor then gets up and he left the party. Jagger then said to Ronnie, I think he's serious. Ronnie said, yeah, it sounds like it. Mick thought about it for a few moments and then mumbled to Ronnie, will you join? Ronnie replied back, of course I would, but except I'm with the faces and I can't let them down. I don't want to split them up. Jagger then said, I don't want you to split them up neither, but if I get desperate, can I call you? Ronnie said, sure, and they left it at that. They even shook hands. The story came from Ronnie's book. Mick Taylor was not bored with the Stones, but with himself. There was a lot inside he needed to get out. At times in the Stones, there was a time gap of boredom. The boredom was when they weren't doing anything. There was no direction happening. This was distancing himself from the band. When they played, there was certainly enough solos for Mick to play. So he was not bored there. He just had more inside and needed a way to express it. His personal life was also impacted and the Stones became his life. His marriage was unraveling and he was deep in with heroin. He also felt a bit abandoned for the lack of credit for co-writing songs on its only rock and roll. Taylor said, if he was older, he would probably not have left. No regrets, though. Black and Blue. There are three initial recording sessions. December 74 in Munich. Then there was a holiday break. Then on to Rotterdam, Holland in January and February of 1975. Then back again to Munich in March and April of 75. Munich. The Four Stones and engineers Chris Harwood and a bit later Glenn Johns, Ian Stewart, and Nicky Hopkins arrive at Musicland Studios in Munich, West Germany. December 5th through the 19th. Here they will record around 11 tracks in two weeks and include some overdubs. Things were going very smooth and moving along quickly. On December 12th, the Stones officially announced Taylor's departure. Bill Wyman had thought of leaving the Stones also, but he did not want to be the person to break up the band. So he thought. Keith did send Mick Taylor a telegram. Really enjoy playing with you the last five years. Thanks for all the turn-ons. Best wishes and love. Mick Taylor's wife, Rose, said he cried when he read this. The Stones, however, were still annoyed and disappointed with his timing. Keith felt he thinks it was Rose, his wife, fueling this decision. But this was solid proof he didn't fit in. Did he have some type of resume now built up? Can he write songs? In music land in Munich, the gear they had, Keith had his black 1956 Gibson Les Paul the custom. He had the wine red 1960 Gibson Les Paul Jr. He had the 54 Macabre Telly, Newman custom number one, a 53 Malcolm Telly. Bill used the Dallas Tuxedo Bass. Charlie, his black Gretsch, or his newly acquired brown kit. Amps were Fender Twin Reverbs and Ampeg Combos. One of the first songs that they played was Act Together, also known as We Got Our Shit Together. Here we see Keith playing with Ronnie in July 1974 at one of Ronnie's solo album shows. 
Keith is playing the electric piano along with Ian McLagan. This was a Jagger Richards song, one of two on Ronnie's solo album, I've Got My Own Album To Do. You can see Ronnie and Keith enjoying themselves and this wonderful song and gentle jam. This also included Willie Weeks on bass and Andy Newmark on drums. And you can look at this as being the first version of the New Barbarians. Now Rod also joined a few songs in as well. This performance was at the London Kilburn State Theater. Ian Stewart did attend and felt both Ronnie and Keith played really well together. Here is a taste of what little did they know what would be a future brotherhood. What a jam. During this July 74 gig, Mick was in New York City working with Bill Wyman on the Black Box comp set. It was due out in 1975, but never got developed. Mick also, at this time, was in Nicaragua looking how recent donation proceeds were going and how they were being handled from the recent earthquake funds. That fundraising project back in January of 73. So now we hear a background track of Act Together from the Munich sessions with Keith on electric piano. You hear black and blue certainly developing here and the wonderful Nicky Hopkins on piano, organ, and string synthesizer, along with nice playing of Bill and Charlie. I'm not sure who it was, but it does sound like a Keith acoustic guitar overdub. But this song was just beautiful in how they opened up the sessions. Another song that they did was I Got a Letter. The first thought when you hear this, some reggae and some chunky guitar. The Stones have known of reggae for years, but have never felt it was their time to put out something on an album. They were feeling it and working on it now and doing some jams. There are two outtakes of this song. One is an instrumental, one with Keith on vocals, with Nicky Hopkins, Charlie, and Bill. Not sure all the guitar parts, but this was also worked on in the Rodham Dam sessions in Phase 2. Supposedly this is written by Keith, but never completed. It was about Anita, as he was happy to get a letter from her. She was pregnant and having a baby. There were some other songs that they would play. I don't have too much information on them. Something Good with Nikki, Cable from My Baby, Wind Call, and there were a lot of several jam tracks. But now comes the cream of the crop, Fool to Cry, also known as Daddy, You're a Fool to Cry. It was worked on both Munich sessions, phase one and phase three. This is one of the two songs with Nicky Hopkins playing piano and string synthesizer that he's on the Black and Blue album. Engineers are both Keith Harwood and Glenn Johns. I'm mentioning the names Glenn Johns and Keith. Needless to say, they both are top of the list studio chief engineers. I've spoken about Glenn in prior documentaries. Keith was known for his Olympic studio sessions and with the Class A bands, as you could see from this list, that he's worked with. He's also worked with Glenn Pryor and brother Andy Johns. He worked on the Stones prior album, It's Only Rock and Roll. Now, Glenn Johns is back as sound engineer. Haven't heard of him for a while since Let It Bleed. He had drifted to other projects and let brother Andy pick up with the Stones. He came back because there was a preliminary agreement that he would receive a co-producer credit unless he failed to finish the album for any reason. Fool to Cry is one of Glenn's favorite songs, and he worked very hard on this sound engineering for this song. And he felt the mix that he had done in the studio in Munich of 74 by far is superior than the end result on the album. 
Now, working with the Stones again had started off very pleasant with Glenn. One thing that he noticed was the band was now willing to work very quickly in the Munich sessions. Now, for Fool to Cry, there are other versions of this song that are simply breathtakingly brilliant. I'll be getting into the song a little bit later. Another song, going to the reggae side again, the Eric Donaldson song written in 1971 was their choice. Eric was a Jamaican reggae artist since 1964, and the song initially was not taken seriously at first in the studio. It was there for a laugh, but it developed enough, as we know, to be a keeper. Cherry O Baby. There was a lot of jamming going on here and plenty of Nicky on the organ. This is the second of his two songs on Black and Blue. So more on this one also later. So now they have a holiday break. And December 23rd, Keith Richards joins the Faces for a London show again at the Kilburn State Theatre. This was dubbed as Rod Stewart and the Faces and their final UK show. This is some great video of this show, playing Sweet Little Rock and Roller. You could see on their faces having fun, jamming and grooving it. Another expose of Ronnie, his antics on stage and why he would fit as a stone. Now Ronnie also around his time was in search of love and in need to be part of a family, a band. That's what the family he wanted. He'd just gone through a rough patch in his life. He had recently lost his mom and some other close people. This had happened in the past few years. Losing his mom was the worst. December 26, the four stones appear on the VIX radio program, Hunky Chunky Radio Show. They spoke to hospital patients on the phone. January 6th to the 19th, Keith, Ronnie, and Jimmy Page jam at Wick Studios at Ronnie's house. Keith also worked with Alexis Corner in London on a recording session at CBS, including Peter Frampton, Steve Marriott, and Nikki. It was for the recording of Get Off My Cloud for Alexis. Keith did some backing vocals and some guitar. Now, phase two of the Black and Blue recording sessions was in Rotterdam, Holland, the Netherlands, January 23rd to the end of February. The name of the place was De Dolan, it was Ian Stewart that found this rehearsal space. It was used for an orchestra rehearsal. And it was big. Keith Harwood and Glenn Johns were at these sessions. Billy Preston was now invited and to be now a permanent part of the sessions and tour. Also included was drummer and percussionist Ollie Brown of Billy's band. The Rotterdam sessions were being used, as many of us know, for working on the new album, but it doubled as an audition for a new guitarist. This list was of superstars and not so well-known ones, but were just as good. Now, this list supposedly included, give or take, others, but get the idea of the seriousness. Leslie West... Wilco Johnson, Shuggy Otis, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Robert A. Johnson. He played lead guitar on John Entwistle's solo albums. Joey Molin from Badfinger. Bobby Tench, also known as Bobby Gass, played with Freddie King and Van Morrison. Peter Frampton, he was recommended by Bill Wyman and Stu. Steve Marriott. Mick Ronson, Lowell George from Little Feet, Roy Buchanan, Dave Edmonds, Chris Spedding, Martin Stone from Savoy Brown, Nils Lofgren, Luther Grosvenor, also known as Ariel Bender from Mata Hoople, 
Clem Clemson from Humble Pie and Strange Brew. There were probably a few others. Now, the Rolling Stones mobile unit was parked outside the Rotterdam Rehearsal Theater facility. It was recently updated with new equipment, a 16-track expanding to a 24-track. The mobile unit was used in the past Stones recordings, as we know, always parked outside of a location. The mobile unit was Mick's idea to save money. Glenn Johns felt it made no sense at all. The issues Glenn had was the guitarist auditions and having to work in the mobile unit outside the rehearsal space and being parked in the street away from the action. If he wanted to adjust the microphone or get a better sound, then Glenn would have to walk up four flights of stairs, walk down a maze of hallways if he wanted to get up there. So, one other artist, guitarist, Jeff Beck. He was invited for jams. We sort of cannot imagine Keith and Jeff as a dual guitar pair, but they did have some blues jams. One song being a hit was Heat Wave from Martha and the Vandellas that they jammed. It was an instrumental jam. They also did Jeff's newer song called Freeway Jam as Jeff finished up his Blow by Blow album. They played several songs, including Shame, 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 Shirley Goodman's 75 hit. She also sang on Let It Loose. Rory Gallagher. Some of you know him, some of you don't. If you don't, go give him a listen, please. I'm going to let his brother, Donald Gallagher, his manager also, to tell the story of him going to audition for the Stones. Now, this is an outtake from a documentary called Songs and Stories, New York Remembers Rory G. It's by hometeamproductions.tv. If you get a chance and into Rory, this is a good watch. Like the time when Mick Taylor left the Stones, the big question around the world is, who's going to replace Mick Taylor? And I went upstairs and I remember Rory had gone to bed and I woke Rory and I said, Rory, you won't believe this, it's uh, Ian Stewart is on the phone. I said, the Stones want you. And he wouldn't answer the phone, he thought it, because I was always pulling pranks. <laughs> I had to go back down and keep talking to Ian Stewart until Rory eventually came down and sort of had a conversation. It was, they wanted him to go to Rotterdam in Holland and start recording uh, an album. He said, I know the Stones, I know the music. they're not going to, they, you know, they're just going to, uh, they want me to go. I said, Rory, don't be crazy. And he did, he, he literally took a small little Fender Champ amplifier and his Stratocaster guitar and got on the plane to Rotterdam by himself. And uh, he was there for three or four nights. And uh, it, 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 the situation was unresolved because what it, it was occurred is that at that time there was a little bit of acrimony between Jagger and Richards. And I, I think Jagger from Rory, had seen Rory as a very professional guy touring, great ethos, obviously. And musically, they admired him because they had tried to sign him to their record label uh, earlier on. And uh, so. But the sessions would start at Keith Richard hours, three in the morning or whatever. And uh, so after the, th the second night, Rory sort of said, well, look, Marshall Chess, who was then sort of looking after the Stones in a management capacity, they were all, I mean, the press started to run, the story started to leak out. So I've, I still have the press cuttings in, in, in the European ones. They, the story broke first. And uh, so Rory said to, to, to Mick Jagger, he said, look, you know, what am I going to do? I've got this tour in Japan, and I've, I've got to leave tomorrow at some point. But, and he said, oh, well, look, you know, I want you in. Will, will you go up and talk to Keith? Because it's got to be Keith's decision as well. And uh, so the, they left. The, the, the terrible thing is that they le Rory went up to Keith's room and sort of went into Keith's room and tried to wake Keith, who was comatose and waited up and sort of went back a couple of hours later and didn't get any sleep himself. And he just couldn't come around and then he figured, well, I've got to get on the plane. Rory flew back. I met him at Heathrow Airport in London, came off the flight in Rotterdam and we got on the plane for Tokyo. That's the type of 
schedule he kept. So I, I, I always gave him a lot of stick. I said, if, if you had let me come, you'd... <laughs> yeah. And he said, we would have had to cancel the Japanese tour. What about the kid? And I said, hey, you know, you could have all of us come back and done that a few months later. And, and well, you know, would everybody, we just, you know, sold bigger venues, actually, <laughs> if you'd come, you know. Now, Rory, as a permanent stone, I personally don't think it would work. Rory's too much of an alpha male, and I don't think he would just want to be a role model consistently. I would, however, love to hear those tapes of that jam. That would be priceless. Rory would later say he felt he did not lose any opportunity of a lifetime. If somebody needed a guitar player for a tour and he was free in the right moment, he'd do it and it'd be fun. It would be so much less pressure, he said, if he would just stand and play some leads. But then again, probably short term. Wayne Perkins. Wayne was invited to Rotterdam, and when he arrived, he got right off the plane, went directly to the audition with guitar in hand. Keith and Bill were on the couch, and there was a spotlight on in the middle of the room. Wayne put his guitar down and stood there. As he was meeting both Bill and Keith for the first time. They were just staring at Wayne. They made no attempt to offer him a chair or a seat. So Wayne just figured he'd walk right into the spotlight. Now while he was talking to Keith, Mick and Charlie walk in and they stood right next to him in the spotlight and close. Wayne looked at them both and they were both looking straight ahead and then they just walked away without saying a word. It was a physical appearance time, no playing, just seeing if Wayne looked the part. Wayne was from Alabama, born in 1951. His mom and dad played guitar. At age 12, he got his first six string. He played along and picked up his playing, listening to Chet Atkins, James Burton, and Lonnie Mack. Not bad at all. He would just sit and play and play and play and jam with his dad, at the local shindigs and play with many bluegrass players. This eventually led him to be a demand studio session player. He dropped out of high school at age 18, and he started spending time at Muscle Shoals in the late 60s. He became a session player for Joe Cocker, Leon Russell, and Jimmy Cliff. Also Steve Winwood and Bobby Womack. He became the house guitarist Jim Johnson, Scholz's co-founder, he would say that he was very inventive on everything he played on. It was like he was born into it, a natural up there, just like with Dwayne Allman and Eddie Hinton. Wayne was also asked while at Scholz to join Leonard Skinner. He happened to be real good friends with Ronnie Van Zant, And basically, Wayne would just say, you guys don't need me. Wayne was getting a lot of work thrown at him. And while at Muscle Shoals, the founder of Island Records, Chris Blackwell, was there. He had brought Jimmy Cliff, Traffic, and Steve Winwood there to record. Chris was at Muscle Shoals to record Jim Capaldi's album. Paul Kossoff and Steve Winwood was there also. Wayne became really good friends with both of them. Wayne was with his trio band, Smith Perkins Smith. And Chris took them back to England and signed them, the first American band to sign with Island. They toured with Free, Uriah Heep, Fairport Convention, and Matahoople. Wayne was doing plenty of session work in England also. Chris then got him a gig with Bob Marley for his 1973 album called Catch a Fire. When Wayne got to the recording studio, he said he walked into a fog, a fog of cannabis. Chris Blackwell wanted Marley's album to reach the rock market. He wanted Wayne to do the southern rock thing. While Wayne was waiting to take on his part for Concrete Jungle song, Wayne had to ask, how do I approach this music? It's just too strange. Blackwell had to tell Wayne that drum bass, 
cymbal snare, or on the one and three beats. Ignore the bass that is actually a lead instrument. And Wayne would say how everything seemed to be feeling like it was being played backwards. The engineer had to lower the bass to simplify and cause less confusion. So this technique got Wayne to understand the groove. So I'm listening, and I'm sitting here trying to figure out what's going on, and I can't find the one. To save my ass, I cannot find the one. So um, I'm going, Chris, what's going on? He said, just stop and listen to it. Don't listen to the bass. And they brought the bass down for me just a little bit. I said, all right. And I'm listening. All of a sudden, something starts to settle in, and I'm going, okay. All right. So I said, all right, roll the tape. He nailed the guitar solo on the second or third take. He nailed it. They started playing this strange music. I mean, I'd never heard the likes of. It was so... Uh, compared to anything else I'd ever heard in my life, everything, uh, the R&B, the church music, anything I'd ever, ever heard, um, this was backwards. And I had this pedal on at the end of the solo, as I recall, which was a sustain pedal uh, from Manny's that I bought in New York. And you hit this thing, and it just like held a note forever. It would hold a note for three minutes. And it held that one note and would start to feed back in an octave higher, and then two octaves higher than that. And when that happened, they tossed it, but Blackwell or somebody hit that, uh, Tony hit the, uh, the echo on that thing, and it just, I mean, it like rang across the whole room. It just sent everybody, it gave me goosebumps. It was one of those magic moments, and then Marley come running out there trying to cram this, this long down my throat, just jumping up and down, patting me on the back, going, you know, that's it, man, and I had no idea what he was saying. Marley came in the studio and was doing cartwheels. He was so excited. Wayne had no idea, no idea what Marley was saying to him, but could tell how happy he was. Now Wayne was accepted, and they were slamming spliffs the size of drumsticks into his mouth. Wayne got real high, and he was just 21 years old at this time. A lot was going on for Wayne. He eventually went out to California, hanging with Jackson Brown, recording at A&M with him a small, cohesive community in L.A. And there, Joni Mitchell was across the hall recording her Court and Spark album. She happened to meet Wayne out in the hall, and she led him into the studio to listen. They hit it off and eventually just lived together in David Geffen's Beverly Hills mansion. Wayne was also now working with Levon Helm, Johnny Prine, and Albert King. He was also a major role with Leon Russell and doing some touring with him. This is when he met Eric Clapton. Wayne was hanging with Eric in December of 1974 in Jamaica while Eric was making There's One in Every Crowd album. Wayne had been there for a few months in Kingston. One day at breakfast, Eric said to Wayne, did you hear Mick Taylor quit the Stones? And Wayne came back with, did they find anyone to take his place? Eric did not think they had, so Wayne asked if Eric could put in a call for him. So Eric called Jagger and said, hey, this boy can play some guitar. Eric knew, though, Wayne may not look the part with his denim and flannel shirts. A few months earlier, Wayne had played bass on Bill Wyman's solo album, Monkey Grip. But he didn't meet Bill in the session. There was a time when Marshall Chess was in Rotterdam also while they were in the studio, and he was going to go score for both he and Keith. Keith did not want to go into the studio dry. The others knew Keith had to score, so while they wait for Keith, they would jam and work out the sounds for songs. 
if Keith was not prepared, he would not play. So Marshall scored once, but it turned out to be cat litter. Well, I'm talking about killing yourself with dough. With dough? <laughs> Bro, I wish there was some around, man. I'd have to get high right now. Cellophane Trousers. That was a song that included Wayne Perkins playing some leads. It's about a five-minute instrumental. This song does sound familiar and surely has the obvious Keith chords and riffing with its twangy guitars. At this point, there's nothing stand out on this song or so exciting, but this one did have potential. This song was also brought in phase three, the second Munich session in March. However, this song was brought out again during the Some Girl sessions in 1978. Engineer Chris Kimsey heard this. He recognized it as a high potential and he pushed it further with the Stones. It ended up as a polished song on Undercover album and the song was called Too Tough. The next song at Rotterdam was a song called Black and Blue Jam or was also called Vagina. But we come to know the song as Slave. Yeah, it, this is a black and blue outtake and the original version was played with Jeff Beck. There are several takes during these sessions with vocals and rambling and overdubs. If you give a listen, the ad-libs are very close to Too Much Blood. In this song, Mick gives orders to his girlfriend to pick up a few things at the liquor store. As mentioned, there's other versions and other overdubs, especially later on with Sonny Rollins on sax. Billy's playing organ and Ollie Brown on percussion. Pete Townshend is also on backing vocals. You hardly, probably can't even hear him. The version we hear now was compiled of two cut tapes from different sources. This is another display of Mick's uncanny talents. Bob Clear Mountain, as we know, took this off the shelves for Tattoo You in 81. Worried About You, also known as Sometimes I Wonder Why, recorded in the Rotterdam sessions also. And you could surely hear this as a black and blue outtake. It fits in with that piano and organ. That falsetto carries over from Fool to Cry. That wonderful electric piano is Billy. This was also played live in the 1977 Toronto El Macambo Club. That great lead guitar. You could thank Wayne Perkins for that. Supernatural. As we know, this was brought out in Tattoo You. Another song, Come On Sugar, or Let's Do It Right. This was a funky, funky groove. This one includes Jeff Beck also. He has this one on his own bootleg. The lyrics were never completed though. Crazy Mama, the straight ahead Stones rocker on Black and Blue. Mick wrote this in the studio, all of it, it just flowed. A crazy mama wearing a ball and chain and a sawed off shotgun. Starting out here in Rotterdam phase two, it went flat. Not much put down here at the early stage. It did pick up in phase three back in Munich in March. It's Mick opening with the guitar playing on this. Sounds surprising, but then Keith comes in. Keith also is playing the slide, bass, and piano. And more on this later. I Love Ladies, also known as Sexy Night and Lovely Lady, still with Keith Harwood and Glenn Johns Engineering. This one has Jeff Beck still on it, and similar to a little falsetto like Fool to Cry, and with part reggae beat, a soft ballad. You can hear the experimentation going on here. Jeff Beck later was invited also to Munich, Phase 3, invited by Mick to jam some more. The arrogant Beck thought the Stones could not funk it up enough with Bill and Charlie. 
But then again, when I think about it, we can go the other way and Jeff could not maybe rock it enough. I do not believe there was ever an intention to bring on Jeff. The chemistry would have just been a disaster. Now something to keep in mind, when the Stones would be in the studio, they would still be going back to their archives to prior years and listening to songs and trying to bring them back to life. As I mentioned with some of the black and blue songs were brought later on, but here they went back to Goat's Head Soup and it's only rock and roll sessions. They were listening to those songs and thinking about it. Waiting on the Friend, Tops, Criss Cross, a few. Melody came from when Mick and Billy were messing around with just piano and vocals. This song is all about the piano and vocals. Just a four bar bass and drum beat, old fashioned style. The song took its full life at these sessions. There was some overdubbing, Billy on piano and organ, and adding Arif Martin for horn arrangement. What a story told by Mick on this one. The protagonist tells a story of a girl with her second name, Melody. The lyrics are pretty obvious of what she does to him, and he's on her trail to catch her. Now, disaster hits the stones. The rehearsal space had a great acoustics for an orchestra, but not a rock and roll band. With all the musicians and auditioning coming in and coming out, the session tempo got dragged down. The focus on the songs and delivery and recordings of the album was totally dragged down. The band was into jamming and they weren't as focused as they were in Mutic in the first session. Recording time was wasted according to Glenn Johns. He was losing his patience. With Glenn being out in the mobile unit and the stones inside the building, Glenn was just so annoyed with this logistical setup. There was a particular take when Keith came out of the studio and came into the truck to give it a listen to. Glenn was unaware of this and also the tapes were not rolling. A major head clash and FUs. Glenn ended up just walking out, never seeing black and blue to completion. Glenn had thought Rory would have made a great stone. He said Mick and Keith did not really even say hello to him. Now Wayne, well he was hanging out and living with Keith now in a cottage after the sessions behind Ronnie Wood's Wick residence. Anita, Angela, and Marlon were there. Ronnie was there working on his second solo album. Wayne started really feeling he actually may become part of this entire Stones family. Ronnie was still with the faces and Wayne was not only playing with Keith, but he was also writing and getting high. Both of them, Wayne and Keith, they'd go out dashing out for drives in Keith's Ferrari or Bentley. They'd go out to clubs or music stores. Now Wayne at this point had his black Gibson Les Paul, his custom, and also had an old Fender Telly and a Strat. Now Wayne would say when he was alone with Mick or Keith, it was great. They got along. But when the three of them were together, the dynamics and feelings were real strange. He felt under a microscope. Both Mick and Keith were going back and forth over the auditions and also over Wayne. But Wayne really got the impression from Keith he was in. Keith was teaching Wayne their songs and gave him two cassettes, about 60 songs worth, that they might play on the next 75 tour. This concludes part one of the Black and Blue In-Depth Review Insight. Upcoming will be part two, of course, and it will involve the third Munich sessions onward to their rehearsals in Montauk, their preparation, 
and going into their 1975 tour. Very interesting material, and hope to see you there. Please leave a comment. Hopefully it's a good one, but let me know your thoughts. Thank you, and have a great one, and we'll talk soon.